Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Lillian Hogendorn. I'm the Digital Access and Open Educational Resources Lead here at eCampus Ontario. And um, this is our monthly webinar and we're super excited to have you all here. Um, I also get to introduce Meredith Jacob. Uh, Meredith is the Project Director at Creative Commons USA. Um, so I believe I just stopped my screen sharing. One second. Okay, so, um, and I've got dogs barking and everything. It's the joy of working at home. So Meredith uh, manages the day-to-day -day of Creative Commons USA. She's a fantastic speaker. She's uh, all around an expert in all things Creative Commons licensing. And she's also the Assistant Director for Academic Programs at the Program for Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University. Meredith, is, is that accurate? Um, it is, yeah. It's a very long, we've had a a super long acronym, but that's academia for you. That's awesome. There you go. Um, and um, Meredith came to Ontario in, in February, I think, to, to give a, a talk at, at Guelph. And I had the, the privilege of meeting at Meredith and, and chatting with her and hearing her talk about sort of the intersection of fair dealing and copyright and open licensing and how you can navigate all of that in OER. And I think this is going to be an awesome opportunity uh, for us all in Ontario and anyone who's here from outside of Ontario to, to hear uh, what Meredith has to say. So um, with, without further ado, I'll stop my share and I'll let Meredith uh, take over here. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Lillian, and thanks to you all for taking the time to join us. Um, my hope here is to talk about how we can use the sort of combined tool set of open licensing and the existing limitations and exceptions in copyright law, which is fair dealing primarily in Canada and fair use in the United States, to create high quality um, pedagogy driven teaching resources. So I think you know, a lot of people get into the work of OER um, to create high quality resources, but then as they learn a little bit more about copyright, um, they can find themselves taking sort of a circuitous route to avoid a uh, real or perceived copyright um, risk. And fundamentally, I think a lot of that worry is over, um, over exaggerated. And I think that in fact, uh, fair dealing and fair use are powerful tools for creating OER and that fundamentally the core teaching and learning purposes that they both permit are actually really similar in the US and Canada and so that sort of additionally concerns about incompatibility between the two are um, overblown. And so as uh, Lillian said, we can take questions during the uh, presentation itself, but also I'll reserve some time for the end. Um, as I got more into working with K through 12 teachers as well, I think I've become uh, more aware of how bad the pedagogy is of me just sort of talking to you about my slides and holding all the questions for the end. So I would encourage anybody who has questions during the webinar, <clears throat> sorry, during the webinar itself to uh, either put those in the Q&A or put them in the chat. Um, I'm not sure I can see the chat right now in this view. So Lillian, if you see a question in the chat, um, will you- I'll Bring it forward, yeah. I'll monitor the chat and the Q&A for you. <laughs> oh, there, I got the chat. All right, all set. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what um, parts of OER and open access are enabled by Creative Commons licenses and how that works within the copyright system. Um, we'll also talk about sort of the copyright basics that those things are bound by how the Creative Commons licenses work um, and how in OER programs you'll see uh, fair use and fair dealing enabling new uh, teaching resources. So um, open educational resources are any educational materials that are released under an open copyright license rather than under a traditional all rights reserved copyright. Um, so open access and open science are similar but they focus on access to research articles, research data and research tools rather than teaching resources directly. And um, so unlike traditional educational materials, OER have been released under an open copyright license that allows people to update and remix, translate, share new versions, and post online, all with clear legal rights rather than tolerated use. There's always this absurdity, I think, of going to professors or teachers and saying, hey, I have good news for you. Uh, now you can share things or now you can remix because 
obviously the process of teaching has always included these things, right? Teachers and professors have always taken parts of different resources and used them to do what they think is the most effective teaching. However, the important thing about the open license and the thing that distinguishes it from materials that are just free um, is that you have the legal permission to do things. So there's a ton of information on the internet, um, written work, photographs, videos, and you know because it's posted on the open internet, you probably have some implied license to read it. Um, the fact, for example, that the New York Times has a print button probably creates an implied license to print that thing. Um, but what you don't have are full legal permissions to do that. And the Creative Commons licenses are giving you the formal permission to do these things. The Creative Commons licenses work within the copyright system. So to understand them, we have to understand a little bit more about copyright. Copyright law grants to the author owner a set of exclusive rights to do stuff with a creative work, to reproduce it, to make derivatives, to sell it, to distribute it to the public, to perform or display. And it gives you those rights, those ways to have control, and it limits them with copyright limitations and exceptions. Those are fair dealing, fair use, and then also other more specific limitations and exceptions about access for people with disabilities or preservation that you might also see in your national law. Copyright owners can assign any or all of the rights in their copyright. So one of the ways you would do that is to do write a license. Uh, typically in the sort of pre-internet era, licenses were uh, negotiated one-to-one -one because transactions happened in commercial ways for large groups of people. And so if I wanted to give uh, Lillian, for example, the rights to make a book or a movie from my book, we would sit down, our lawyers would hash that out, and you don't really need this public license. So the Creative Commons licenses really came into being to address the fact that the internet gave us these, internet and computing broadly, gave us these really powerful digital publishing tools. Many of you work with those when you create OER, you modify it. But before those digital tools, publishing was a relatively rare enterprise, right? You had to be a business, you had to do it that way. But now we have technology tools that allow anyone to be a publisher, and we needed legal tools that matched up with that. And so the Creative Commons licenses work as one way for people to assign some of the licenses and copyright and say, I'm the author of this work, but I'm giving you the right to use it. Copyright law, we talked about the exceptions, limitations of fair use and fair dealing. There's also law that um, protects the public domain. So uh, works that are in the public domain when the copyright term has expired or uh, works that are for a statutory reason in the public domain. So works created, for example, by US federal employees in the course of their employment are in the public domain or works dedicated to the public domain via CC0. Um, all countries have a structure of limitations and exceptions to copyright law. Um, in some countries that are uh, more primarily civil law countries, so continental Europe and legal systems that derive their base from that, copyright law has a lot of sort of small specific exceptions. So there might be one for criticism, one for parody, one for education, one for electronic transfer. So there's very sort of piecemeal. In contrast, uh, fair use and fair dealing are both broader, general, and flexible limitations that say, we're going to give you a set of steps to think through, and you're going to be able to deal with a lot of different cases based on those steps. So Canada has both. Canada has both specific exemptions, but um, recently, I think particularly in the past 10 or 15 years, we've seen the courts in Canada really uh, document a broad and flexible fair dealing provision. Um, so we talked about this, I talked about a little bit out of order, but an open license works within the copyright system. It doesn't conflict with copyright existing. One question we often get is if you see a work that's both marked with both a copyright symbol and an open license, people are like, well, can that even be true? And the answer is, yeah, like all works that are protected by copyright um, can be marked with that copyright symbol, but the license is giving you this permission to do it. Um, as we said earlier, open licenses are from one to many, from the public to anyone who wants to use it, and they grant the full set of rights 
that um, the author originally had. So the right to access, to reproduce, to display, to adapt and distribute for any purpose. The advantages of these open licenses are that they allow you to use digital distribution authorship, remix, translate, and improve. And it makes all these types of informal reuse formally permissible. So as you think through using a third party material, you sort of have to ask yourself two questions. If you want to take something and include it in your OER, what is the copyright status of what I want to use and what is the purpose that I want to use it for? So this flowchart is one way that it sort of I structure my thoughts when I'm thinking about this. So the first question is, is this thing covered by copyright law? And many things are covered by copyright law. Most people who study the copyright system will tell you too much is not covered by copyright law. So anything that is eligible for copyright, so anything that has original authorship and is a type of subject matter that is eligible is automatically protected by copyright. So music, text, um, so probably like, you know, a two word text message is not protected by copyright. Um, but when you write a three paragraph email to someone explaining how bad an idea you think their idea is, that is definitely protected by copyright. Um, images are protected by copyright, uh, music, art. So a lot of stuff is covered by copyright law. The good news, I think, is that a lot of the things that are very important for creating open educational resources um, in the sort of very first instance are not, in that ideas are not protected by copyright. So when you sit down to create an OER, it is not a closed book test. You are not expected to sit down and create your OER from scratch. Um, many things that you'll need to use, ideas from other books, pre-existing research, the ideas in those are not protected by copyright. And I think this is particularly important to think through in an academic setting because we're often operating where the rules of plagiarism and attribution can seem sort of blurred into the rules of copyright law. So plagiarism and uh, academic ethical norms around attribution are very important in saying where your ideas came from. What they are not is the correct framework to evaluate, are you infringing copyright? So, Again, in the, I'm going to use Lillian and I's examples. If Lillian writes a really smart article about um, the history of uh, Ontario, and she does a lot of research, and she goes and she reads microfiche, and she, you know, travels around and goes to all of these old city archives, and she does all that work, and she writes this really good article and includes some really new perspectives on the history that didn't exist before. I come after her and I write a very similar article and I cite to all of her work, but I don't do any of the research myself. I just really use her article and I rewrite the words, but I've done no additional research. If I don't cite to Lillian's work, that is bad academic practice. And if, ooh, sorry, um, and if I use a quote from her without attribution, it might be plagiarism but that is not the copyright law analysis. And that is just important to keep separate. That questions about, did I attribute to her work? Am I doing new scholarship? Is my article a, a valuable piece of work? Those are all really important to keep as academic norms, but they are not copyright norms. And as we think through OER, I think that's important to remember because obviously very much in OER, the sort of core question I get is, can I use parts of existing textbooks, commercial textbooks, to make new textbooks, right? It's a classic, people want to use chapters. And the answer is, no, generally you can't do that, right? Like generally fair use and fair dealing won't allow that sort of direct substitutional copying. On the other hand, the ideas in those textbooks, that this is the way you organize a biology textbook, that this is what you should cover, the ideas in those textbooks are generally not what we protect by copyright. And so I think too often it feels like this Herculean task to try to sit down and start from scratch. And you might need to attribute, you might not. Some stuff I think is really generally held knowledge, like you know, there is a limit to that. But that is really separate from questions around um, plagiarism. This also comes up in quotation. Um, you know, if you're quoting from, uh, 
a source if it is fair use or fair dealing. If you attribute, that might be useful, but questions about attribution and whether you've properly attributed are not generally copyright law questions. They are academic integrity questions. And it doesn't mean that they aren't worth thinking about, but it does mean that you shouldn't graft them into your copyright analysis. So here, just to sort of come back to this question here. The original question is, is this covered by copyright law? And so if it's an idea, not an expression, if it's in the public domain, in all of those situations, it's not, um, it's not covered by copyright law. So you can do whatever you want with it. You can use all of it. You can print shower curtains with it. You don't need to go any farther. The answer there is yes. You just go ahead. No, it's not covered by copyright law. Yes, you can practice. If it is covered by copyright law, the next question you need to ask is, do I have the ability under fair dealing or another copyright limitation or exception that allows me to do that? Um, so those sort of situations would be um, where you're using something for quotation or illustration, um, when you're using it for a new transformative purpose. Um, we're not going to go in this webinar into a deep dive in fair dealing law, um, but we have an hour and 45 minute webinar about fair dealing law that we did um, three weeks ago with three amazing Canadian experts, um, Ariel Katz, Karis Craig, and Lucy Gibbo. Um, you could not ask for a more all-star panel and we go really deep into these cases, but um, the sort of takeaway from that, I'll give you an hour and 40 minutes of copyright law in uh, you know, 18 seconds is that very broadly, when you are using something for a new educational purpose and you are using um, the amount appropriate to that use and you are not substituting for the original, you are broadly speaking in an area where fair use and fair dealing is its most powerful. Um, so if you have the ability to use something under fair use or fair dealing, you don't need to get to the question of is there a Creative Commons license? Because fair dealing is a user's right. And a, you, so if you have the legal right to do something under fair dealing, you don't need to reach this question of do I have an institutional license or subscription? Is there a Creative Commons license? Or is this some sort of allowed free classroom use? So um, I'm going to pause here and to see if anyone wants to ask a question in the chat or unmute in how to think through this copyright evaluation. I know it's a little slower on a webinar so we're going to get their questions up, so we'll take a moment. All right, I'll keep going, but we are gonna have about 30 minutes for questions, so I wanna make sure that people start thinking them through now. So there is a great question here. There's a, there is a, yeah, there's a question in, in, the, in the chat, I was going to say. Oh, look, Meredith, do you have it? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So um, there's a, an example from the, the question from the chat that says, if I put an image in my PowerPoint, do I need a license? And I think as all copyright questions come up, there, there are two questions really bound up in there. What does the law say and what is the risk? So generally, um, you know, in situations where you're using a PowerPoint in class, um, there are two different ways to evaluate that. From a copyright standpoint, the question might be, what is the image I'm using, right? The, um, in both fair use and fair dealing, looking for sort of a new educational purpose from a non, um, for something that was not originally educational material is, um, is often fair use and fair dealing. Um, so in, in Canada, basically, the, um, I'm trying to look for this, look for this example. So I think the first instance to sort of think about is that you have to look for a new purpose and you have to look for a question about whether or not you're using something that is normally, um, that you would be normally paying for in that situation, but are using in a context that would be substitutional for the original. So PowerPoint slides are tricky because generally there's not a very big market in PowerPoint slides. Um, so I think uh, I don't, most situations in which you use images in PowerPoint slides, licenses aren't needed, right? 
Um, if, for example, it comes from a paid licensed database and you've just chosen to copy instead of paying for it, that might be true. But again, it comes down to why you're using the image. Um, generally, copyright, both in fair use and fair dealing, is less um, protective when you've chosen images for sort of just because I want to, just because it's a good aesthetic, just because I want it for a background, and it's at its strongest when you're using them for a critical or educational purpose. So um, it would be very different in this example about whether or not you can put an image in your PowerPoint if you have to use that image for your teaching purpose, if that's the appropriate image. So say, for example, you're creating a PowerPoint presentation for students that's talking about how press photography has changed. And you're going to use press photographs from the 1930s, from the 1950s, you know, from the 80s and from today. You have to use those photographs for your teaching purpose. And so in those examples, right, both actually, you would probably be covered by specific Canadian exceptions that cover um, educational uses like the reproduction um, for examination or for performance in class. You might be covered by those specific edu educational exceptions. You might also be covered by um, broader sort of fair dealing analysis saying these images were originally used for a press purpose and they are now um, being used for a teaching purpose. So in that example, you have a high likelihood of your use being fair dealing. Um, if instead you went to a paid stock photograph site and just copied and pasted a picture of flowers because you wanted flowers in the backdrop of your slides, the risk there might be really low. But from a copyright law standpoint, you're not going to have as strong an argument. Um, one of the things that I think is really important in thinking through this analysis is understanding what is your pedagogical purpose for including this image. Does that help answer that a little bit? Great. Awesome. And um, Meredith, if, if you would, after this uh, webinar is done, I'd love to include the link to that deep dive webinar that you mentioned in the follow-up email to this. So if you have that, um, we'll circulate that to the people who are here or who missed it but are watching the recording. Yeah, and I'm just putting the five fair dealing factors in the chat. So under Canadian fair dealing, the five factors are the purpose of the use, the character and the amount of the dealing, the alternatives to the dealing, and the effect of the dealing on the nature of the work. Um, and so that is sort of why you need to understand the very first thing, which is what are you, why are you using this in your work? What is the pedagogy? you know, what are the alternatives? And then having alternatives doesn't mean that you need to be, um, like there's no possible way to teach this, but it would have a significant effect on your pedagogy to, um, to have to choose an alternative. We got a second question that says, can you distinguish how the use of material would continue to be fair if it's shared publicly on the open web through an OER, as opposed to sharing in a password protected LMS? So this is a good question. I think a lot of people feel the, um, the tie between uh, educational uses, the need to keep those uses private, um, and the, um, the, um, the use of a password protected LMS or other system like that. And it's, it is a relevant thing to consider, but it is certainly not the case that there is no public use under fair dealing or fair use. So um, fair dealing and fair use are regularly used as a way to include materials for criticism in newspapers, for example. So um, in those situations, um, a newspaper might publish something, an excerpt from a book, an image for critique. And because that is out to the public, it doesn't in any way um, limit the uh, ability to rely on fair use or fair dealing. You need to think through that your audience is different. So when you look at the, um, the factors, the, um, the purpose and the effect on the original work might be differently evaluated when you're putting something in a public OER, but it is certainly not the case that you can never publish something in the context of an OER. 
And I think here it's maybe important to distinguish whether we're talking about embedding content into a book or a book type thing. I mean, I think, you know, we, we don't always use the word textbook, but a big question to me is if I am writing a history textbook or a politics te te textbook and I include an image or an excerpt in that textbook, that context that is, an that is analyzed is going to be in some really significant ways the context of the book. So we often get questions that are, you know, but does this need to be just in the LMS if it's just for the teaching purpose? Well, if what you're talking about are free floating artifacts, like I am just gonna use this article or I am just gonna use this movie, then yeah, the question about whether you're putting them on the open web or putting them in an LMS really matters. But if, um, for example, you're saying, I'm gonna use a paragraph from this essay or I'm gonna use this image or I'm going to use a selection of this novel in the context of my new textbook, then I think in those situations, the ability to, do, to share them on the open web is both part of the purpose and the fair use or fair dealing rationale is clearly bound up with that whole resource. So um, I think we are talking about what are you sharing? The question is, well, what is, you know, what is the context for that fair use or fair dealing? Lillian, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No, I think that, that uh, that's a great answer. Sure. Um, and there's sort of a follow-on question that asks about the um, implications for downstream use. And so I think this is where um, it's really important to remember that every country that is a member of the Berne Convention, which is basically all the countries, um, I think there's like four countries that aren't members of the Berne Union, um, are uh, required to have certain limitations and exceptions to copyright in their national law. One of the core ones is quotation. Um, and so every country, for example, has a quotation limit exception. So even though that quotation exception might be implemented in different ways in different countries, so for the US, US, for example, does not have a specific in the text of the law quotation exception. In the US, quotation is dealt with under fair use. But that doesn't mean that the same actual practice isn't legal in the US in the same way that it is legal in a country with a quotation exception. The answer is that the law might allow it through a different path. And so um, the question in the chat is, if you use an image or another resource that is copyright protected and that you assert is fair dealing and you want to open license the OER itself, are you doing a disservice to other users who want to um, adopt the OER down the road. And I think this is honestly a question, there are two parts to this question. One is, is there any risk? And I think the answer there is, there is a very small risk, but it is the same risk in some ways as them relying on your correct assertion of the open license. So when I create a work and I put an open license on it, I am in some way asserting that that is all my new, my own new material. And if you've worked and tried to search for OER in the past, you'll find out that sometimes that's wrong, right? Sometimes people, I think mostly well-intentioned, put Creative Commons licenses and stuff that is not their own new work. And so that risk that something is mislabeled is a risk that exists without relying on fair use or fair dealing. The risk of something being mislabeled is always there and it is always pretty low. And, and furthermore, the ability of someone else to come after you and get damages against you when you have um, been acting in good faith is pretty limited, particularly um, when you're working at an educational institution. Like the idea that you would rely on an open license that you had no reason to think was incorrect. So that risk always exists, but it's always pretty low. Um, and so then this new question is, okay, but what if that person has included third party images? They've included stuff under fair dealing there's the risk that they're wrong about that being for dealing, right? And um, I think two specific things. One is the risk that you are subject to significant additional liability if you um, rely on that and you're just using the resource is very low. Um, if you're gonna update and republish the resource, you're gonna distribute it yourself, then I think in some situations you should go through and think through for yourself, broadly speaking, do these uses line up with my understanding of fair dealing? 
Um, I don't think, you know, you don't have to go through and sort of do necessarily an item by item reanalysis, but you might need to check that work. And that is additional work, right? It is, it is something that you might need to do if you're updating your resource. But the flip side of that is it is impossible to teach many of the core subjects that matter in both K through 12 and higher education. It is impossible to teach them without including third party materials. And it is specifically impossible to teach them accurately and responsibly. You know, I think the idea that you can teach, for example, about history without using historical materials, that, that somehow recreating those or only using the ones that are um, in copyright really distorts how we teach these things and it distorts what we teach. And so I think we have to sort of refigure um, our mission risk against this really very small copyright risk. Um, I've sort of two ways of thinking about this. One question that is often a useful question to ask is right now, when you think about, for example, photographs of the Vietnam War, and you want to think about what is the largest tranche of photographs of the Vietnam War that are in the public domain, that is photographs that are taken by US military uh, serving in the conflict, because those photographs are all in the public domain because they're US government works. For me, the question would be, are you satisfied with the crafting your narrative by choosing photographs based on that copyright analysis, not on looking for a like different political or societal perspective on the conflict? And so that's a very extreme example. But um, another example, I think, from a non-copyright standpoint is that every year in middle school, in seventh grade and eighth grade, we have middle schoolers doing chemistry, right? Because we have decided that from a straight up risk analysis standpoint, you cannot learn chemistry if you don't do experiments. So we have Bunsen burners and we have things that are boiling and we have glassware. And I don't have the numbers and I really wish I did. I need to dig into this. But every year, some number of seventh graders must go to the hospital for chemistry related injuries. It's low. It is shockingly low, perhaps, given the nature of being, you know, 12. But um, we do that because we say you have to engage with actually doing chemistry to care about learning about chemistry. And I think that similarly, if we want to do a accurate and responsible job of teaching about the world in which we live, we have to use those third party materials. And I think there are really two broad categories of things that you can think about in OER, right? There's stuff that it would be costly and inconvenient to recreate. And I think that in that situation, people sometimes sort of have this very, uh, I would say maybe like an overactive sense of, well, this is really hard and it's a lot of work, but I could go through and retake these photographs. And I would encourage people not to do that. And I think we see that a lot in STEM, right? Like this, you know, this idea of like, well, I, you know, I think this photograph is right. And I have a fair dealing argument, but I guess technically I could create this workaround. And I would encourage people not to do that. But I don't think it's the core crisis here. I think the core crisis is that OER cannot engage with the humanities. It can't engage with history. It can't engage with, um, Social, you know, like social studies and sort of the K through 12 context, psychology, anthropology, politics, without engaging with those third party materials that document the thing. And in some situations, you could probably pay for licenses, not licenses that you needed, but you could probably find someone to pay. And in some situations, you can't. In some situations, those materials are orphan works and there isn't a person to pay. And in either situation, you know, education is a core purpose that both fair use and fair dealing law enable. And so I think it's important to have um, a risk analysis to think through what is my pedagogical purpose. And I think often we have this problem where general counsel's office don't like making copyright decisions. And so it sort of gets shifted to the professor and then someone sends the professor a copy of the statute and we've sort of had this mismatch between 
their area of expertise and this decision we're asking them to make. But the area where authors and um, professors have expertise is what is the pedagogical purpose of using that? What is your core teaching purpose for using this material? And so um, there's a question in the chat about whether or not OER production use should have takedown policies. And I think that's a complicated question. I think what they should have are question, they should have policies about how you document your pedagogical purpose. Um, you know, here's how I document what third party materials I've included so everyone else can see these are the third party things. Here's the pedagogical reason I'm doing it. Like, what is my teaching purpose? And then I think um, a project that we're working on going forward and that we hope um, for the first time will actually be a joint US-Canada project is a best practices on fair use and fair dealing that really documents thinking through that analysis. Because, you know, this is a new challenge for a lot of people. I think in a lot of ways, OER grew up um, first in STEM. And so people working in science fields, you know, a, a classic question is there are pictures in science that uh, we won't be able to recreate, right? Pictures of the, and now I'm going to try to remember all the names, but of the Mickelson Morley dual split slit experiment, right? You have a picture of that apparatus and that picture can't be retaken, right? That moment, that thing is done, but you could draw an illustration of it. And the answer is like, is that as good? In some ways, probably not, right? But science has allowed us to avoid this idea that you can't avoid it, you know, that you can't avoid relying on fair use. And so uh, similarly, pictures of historical psychological experience from the 50s and 60s that are now held out as abusive or unethical, but there are pictures of those. When you teach them, do you use those pictures? And I think we have to say that fundamentally the teaching purpose is important enough that it's worth doing um, the work of thinking through that fair use and fair dealing. So um, we have about 20 minutes left. I wanted to um, pause here and see if there are any other questions. We've been talking through some, but any questions, anyone who wanted to either unmute themselves or questions in the chat or the Q&A. I think we've uh, hit most of the the questions in the in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, sure. And I, I just wanted to thank you so much, Meredith, for for that explanation and, and let folks know that we have a documentation tool that you can use. I, I dropped a link in the chat uh, just to produce a little fair dealing analysis to have on hand if you feel like you need. Uh, to document that process. Um, we're really, really excited about this project you're working on and we'll replace it with, you know, these best practices when, when they exist. But for now, we have a little stopgap uh, through eCanvas Ontario. Great. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, one of the, we've been doing a, a series of, we've done 10 webinars so far about thinking through how to um, rely on fair use in the emergency, to create, to find OER, to create OER, um, a deep dive on accessibility, um, uh, one on anti-racism and culturally responsive teaching. And the one thing that I think is the core theme that has come up as almost as a surprise to us from um, week to week is that you have to build your team. That these are hard questions about how, you know, Am I teaching the right thing in terms of content? Am I making the right analysis in terms of fair use or fair dealing? And the answer is, those are a lot harder to do alone. And so when you're doing this, um, you know, I think a lot of panelists here or participants here work either in academia or in libraries is to find people who are doing similar work who you can work with through for small group discussion. It feels so different to have to read a good document, even a good document that gives you information and then apply it on your own and then just go out into the world with it. And it feels really different, I think, to have a working group. You know, I think the um, BC campus folks had done, done great work with their subject matter working groups. Um, obviously, you have a really good network here. Uh, the Open Textbook Network has a couple different functions to do that. But I would say whether it's in your area of expertise or in your institution, finding people who are working on similar projects can be really helpful. You know, I think we've talked through, 
you know, understanding the pedagogical purpose and documenting that. And I think if you talk to someone else who's also an expert in your field and you say, hey, this is why I think I need to use this image, this is the teaching purpose, and they go, yeah, I think that makes sense. That gives you a really stronger base to go from and saying, I understand why I'm doing this, I've documented it, and this is why I think it's fair dealing. There's a question that just came up. Is there a difference between sharing and embedding materials in terms of fair dealing? Um, there's a couple different scenarios that might be sort of condensed into that. Um, there is generally a difference between inline linking, where like you have, so if you mean embedding in the HTML sense, where like you've embedded something in a document but haven't actually copied it, um, in many situations that is not treated as um, making a use of the work under copyright law. Um, but if you're talking about embedding it in a textbook, like I take this image and I put it on this page, whether it's print or digital, I have a copy of it. Um, generally, this is not always true, embedding it will actually sort of enhance your fair use or your fair dealing rationale because it provides this um, tangible documentation of what your teaching purpose is. So if, for example, you are teaching a class on uh, the politics of the 1950s and you just email everybody a Dropbox folder full of images and articles and uh, you know, the PDF of a book and just sort of a bunch of stuff, that might be fair dealing or fair use for teaching, but you're going to have to make that argument by trying to argue what you were intending those purposes to be. Whereas if I use those and I have them embedded in a new document where I talk about in this photo, you will see this article illustrates this. And then you have an exercise that's like, read this article for this purpose. Then in those situations, the context is going to be built into the document. And um, as long as you're using it for an educational purpose and it wasn't originally an educational material, it was news or press or fiction or research, you have a strong fair dealing argument there. Awesome. Um, I have a couple examples that we could go through if that would be useful if you don't have any more questions. Uh, no more questions, but I'll let you know as they come up. Okay, one second. Let me pull those examples up. Um, so I am going to share my screen to go through these examples, but because it's in um, Google Slides, um, I won't be, Google Slides is like full, full screen, so I won't be able to uh, see any of you guys once I present. So you'll have to tell me if there are any questions. I'll let you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see. So um, here are some examples of uh, use cases that came up in our US Canada um, OER. So um, here again are the five fair dealing factors from CCH, the purpose, the character, the amount, alternatives, and effect of the dealing. Um, and so then we're gonna look at these examples to talk through whether or not they are fair dealing. So the first is, um, a short quotation that illustrates the rhetorical style of a 20th century leader, or a modern poem for discussion in a literature class, or a passage from a foreign language periodical used in a language learning exercise, or a paragraph from a magazine that's used as the basis for a reading comprehension assessment quiz. So in each of these, what you would think through are how do these work in the five factors? So in the The factors here. So what's the purpose, what's the character and the amount, what are the alternatives, and what is the effect of the dealing on the work. So a short quotation that illustrates the rhetorical style of the 20th century leader. So you take an excerpt from a speech and you're using it in a textbook, right? Is that affecting the market for that original work? No, that was work was created for a political purpose. You're using it for this educational purpose. So that's an example of something that is both, in most usual cases, fair dealing in Canada, 
fair use in the United States. And, and I think this goes to the question about international reuse, those types of quotations are going to be permitted by the national law systems of almost every country because quotation is something that everyone has a quotation exception under burn and most countries have an educational exception. And so this type of use is something that goes on in regular textbooks all the time, right? Textbooks include excerpts, they include images, and it is also permitted in OER. So does anyone, anyone on the call, I can't see the chat, so I'm gonna rely on Lillian. Does anyone have questions or hesitations about how you would use a short quotation of this style in your OER? I see none, but we can wait a second. <laughs> So then the question would be, assuming that you can use it, what do you do? Um, something in the chat. Yeah, so uh, Roger just says short experts or excerpts yeah. are usable under Canadian copyright in some cases without even having to do a fair dealing analysis. Right. And so that can be, uh, right, you don't always get to that. But I think the question is, if you're worried about, um, but it's a good point, you don't have to get, the de minimis uh, example is usually pretty short, like less than you would use for like a longer rhetorical style, but certainly for short quotations, like uh, like America's current political leader who has an unfortunate slogan that shall be not be named, four words, um, we would, you would not need to rely on fair use or fair dealing to uh, use Make America Great Again in a analysis of 20th, 21st century political failure. Um, so, a uh, second example is using um, modern poem for discussion in a literature class. So here, poetry and photographs are interesting because a lot of uh, think people's risk management often focuses on um, using a part rather than the whole, that somehow that feels less worrisome. But uh, I think photography and poetry are both examples of something where the part is really an insufficient thing for study or for critique. Right? You can't realistically critique part of a photograph. And I think particularly for short poetry, um, you can't really critique part of a poem. Like which, how many syllables of this haiku is permissible to in include is obviously sort of an absurd question, right? Like if you were studying a haiku, you need to study the whole thing. And so I think there, even if you are using the whole poem, if you're using it in the context of discussion, you're going into analysis, it's embedded in a poetry textbook, I think that's very, you know, in most of those cases, again, it would be both fair use in the US and fair dealing in Canada. Um, the other two are sort of slightly specialized use cases, but one might be using a passage from a foreign language periodical used in a language learning class. Again, they're not being used for its original news purpose, but instead being used with glossing. You might do something where you have um, a built-in framework to explain words or to ask questions. We've also seen questions about going through and creating um, versions with simplified language. So um, you, know, you might go through and make something, grade something appropriately to your learning population. And then the last is um, using paragraphs as the basis for reading comprehension assessment quiz. And this is one where I think a lot of people have avoided um, using third party materials by linking out. And I think that assessment is one area that sort of shows how that can be pretty um, distracting and uh, unmanageable in the uh, teaching environment. That if what you want someone to do is to read a passage or to comment on that, but to have it linked out really doesn't work within that context. So there isn't a reasonable alternative. Any questions about these examples? Okay. So we're gonna go to another set, which will be uh, still images. So here are some examples of still images that you might use. Um, you could have a historical photograph of a political leader in a textbook on 20th century history you could have a uh, artistic comparison of influential paintings with uh, sort of other architecture and design from that same aesthetic period, or you could have uh, scientific microphotographs that are used to show the process of meiosis in an academic biology text. And so in all of those examples, 
you're using the whole thing in the sort of nature of images. Um, sorry. Um, but again, in each of those, when you think through what is the teaching purpose, what is the reasonable alternative, am I using the appropriate amount, that in all of those situations, there certainly could be extraordinary cases, but these are the types of uses that fall within the sort of normal um, structure of what fair use and fair dealing both allow. There's also an interesting point that I think was brought up um, by Lucy Gabo on our Canadian webinar earlier that was saying the micro photograph one is interesting because it's possible that those pictures aren't even eligible for copyright protection. Um, the, you know, just the act of having a picture is not necessarily sufficient for that to be an artistic uh, work eligible for copyright protection. This isn't uh, a principle that's tried a lot in um, litigation, but it was one of the sort of core questions at the heart of the US monkey selfie case. I don't know if anyone <laughs> knows, but there was a case where a guy had left his camera and a monkey had taken a picture of himself. But for a lot of copyright law, what we require is artistic choice. And so it's hard to assert in that situation that the person who had put down the camera had themselves made the artistic choice in the photograph. A different way that gets applied is in the cases of basically where photographs are data, not where photographs are authorial works. So if I set up, you know, a, a photography array that is fundamentally really data collection and meant to get data, not really meant to create human viewable images, to the it's, it, it is a question for sort of the copyright policy analysis about what extent those are protected by copyright at all, because copyright is really incentivizes artistic creation, not data gathering. So it's possible that micro photograph one isn't even itself protected by copyright law. And I saw a question in the Q in the Q and A pop up, but I can't read it. Yeah, it just says, is it permissible to use a scanned photo from a book in a PowerPoint for teaching? And I think it really touches on a lot of what you're you're saying now, which is it's a, it's about what the nature of the photograph and, and the pedagogical purpose of your use. Yes. So there's nothing about it being a scanned photo in a book that changes. Correct. That it's yeah. about the photo itself and your use itself. Yeah, fair use and fair dealing are both very like content, like tool agnostic. Um, so it, you know, again, if you're scanning it and you're using it, it comes down to what is your, what is your purpose for that use? Not how did you get the image? Um, one example of this, you know, we talked earlier and I said, it's almost never fair use to take segments of textbooks and make a new textbook um, because you're doing something that's really substitutional for that original. An exception to that, I think there are two that might come up. One is for textbooks that you're using not in their original purpose. So an, an example that I talked through is you might very well be able to make a history of psychology textbook using chapters from psychology textbooks if you're using them to document the way in which we have changed how we've taught something, right? I'm using the same chapter from a book over the course of the last 80 years to say, well, wait, we used to teach this this way, now we teach it that way. And so there, even though using that same chapter just to cover the underlying topic might not be fair dealing, using that chapter to illustrate the change in how we've covered something certainly could be. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so we're just wrapping up. Um, we have a collection of video and music clip examples. Um, for example, using a clip or a still from a beer advertisement in a media literacy textbook to say, hey, this is how we've changed advertising. Um, using a short clip from a popular movie in a history class. Um, using complete recordings of popular songs in the context of a course book on a moment in society or using um, jazz instrumentals in a text on trends in music, um, sorry, trends in music. Um, so those things are all examples of using music and video, which I think there's this sort of separate layer of worry about because a lot of those are um, things that might be flagged for takedown by systems like content ID or platforms. And I think the important thing to note there is music and movies are as, 
eligible for fair use and fair dealing as writing and as images. And that just because something has been flagged for takedown doesn't actually mean that they've done any copyright analysis. Almost all takedown requests are um, processed. It's a robot war. They are processed to and responded to by technology, not by humans. So it's just important to keep that in mind in those examples. Awesome. Um, so those examples are from our US Canada one. It's, I think we're waiting for the, the captioning to be synced for it to be up, but it will be at this um, URL that I just put into the chat. Um, our webinar recordings are all up there and um, we're going to keep working on this best practices and fair use. So um, Lillian, you have the ability to email everybody who's registered. For the yes. Website. So yeah, and I was just going to say, um, what we'll do is we'll e email that link out to everybody that's attended the webinar and then also we'll put a, put a link in our Slack channel for the Ontario Open Library Network as well when the captioning is done for the specific webinar um, so that you guys know to, to come and watch it. And I just want to, again, thank you so much, Meredith, for, for your time today. I think it's really important that we open up this conversation in Ontario. And part of us having this webinar, we know this doesn't answer all of your questions because questions come up case by case, but part of it is to create a community of practice that isn't afraid of, of engaging with these principles in Ontario, especially given the current circumstances. Um, we have the Open Library Network. You can connect with people from your discipline there. You can connect with copyright librarians there. You can connect with instructional designers there. Um, you can connect with me there. Um, and we're really, really happy to continue this conversation moving moving forward, we really want this to be a part of the way that our community of practice around OER works in Ontario. Um, and then uh, just one more thing, you saved the date for our July community webinar, which is going to be on July 7th topic TBD. Um, but we've got some folks here who are new to our open library team, Vanya and Samantha, who unfortunately have to go our new OER collections interns. Um, I just want to give them a big shout out and say thank you guys for joining us and I think you'll hear more from them in July if you're wondering what they're actually up to with us. Uh, so that's my, my teaser for July. Um, and uh, thank you once again uh, to Meredith and, and we appreciate all of you for making these webinars and this community series possible. Thanks guys. Thanks.